thank you for and thank you for uh, inviting me. And so I'll start with a little bit of history. <laughs> uh, so that's the that's the Schwartz Center at uh, uh, UCSD. So the director Scott McKeg and uh, and so they really pioneered with you know other people will see. Uh, the field of uh, mobile brain imaging. So uh, this is the same kind of room that we have at UCSD. I think uh, Klaus copied the room that was a <laughs> 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 it. Well, it did this one, and then he went to do the other one in Germany. And then um, Zipping also uh, is very much involved into uh, uh, mobile uh, brain imaging, mostly uh, developing sensors also a uh, driving task, etc. in Taiwan. Johnny Versen, who is also a principal investigator in the lab, is more interested in mobile brain imaging and music. And then we had uh, graduate students at the lab. So we have Tim Willen, who is going to talk tomorrow. We have Christian Koff, who is the developer of LSL. We had Alejandro Orteja, uh, who is uh, uh, the developer of MobiLab. So they created this company that's called Infion. It had different names, but now it's Infion. <laughs> and uh, Alejandro is not part of the company. Now he's, uh, he's moved on to Kernel, which is another BCI company, similar to Neuralink in the uh, Los Angeles area. And of course, we had you know, uh, people who came. Klaus came for a couple of years. I think Stefan came for more than a year, uh, several times. And uh, that's, that's a lot of testosterone. We actually also had. <laughs> Uh, Johanna uh, was interested in gait, so EG during walking, and uh, Grace uh, was working with John on uh, mobile brain imaging during music performance. So, and I put myself in there because I was just watching uh, all these people. <laughs> and so my, my interest is more in uh, mobile brain imaging, has more to do with big data. <laughs> in a sense that uh, we can already do that. I don't know if any people is doing that yet, but you have a free moving uh, person with uh, eye tracking and other biosensors and EEG. And then you have a camera that films the scene and that identifies the object and you know where uh, the person is looking. So we can do that now. So now let's assume that uh, Klaus and Stefan and Barbara have solved all the technical problems and we have almost infinite amount of data. What are we going to do with that data? Well, that's the first part of my presentation is uh, so we can use uh, LIMO. So LIMO is a framework that's in the EG lab to do general linear models with massive amount of variables and also, also talk a little bit about uh, potential application to uh, deep learning. But before we do all that, uh, when you have big data, you need a framework for big data. You can't just like collect lots of files and then, and then sit on your computer and pray that something happens. So that's what I'll talk uh, about first. So the framework for big data, big data. Then the automated pipelines. When you have big data EEG, you need automated pipelines. And then you also need a computational framework. So these are all the tools once we have the data that we can use. So first, uh, uh, BIDS is the data. So we recently published a paper on BIDS EEG. So BIDS is the brain infrastructure uh, data structure and uh, brain imaging data structure. And it was started for fMRI. And that's basically a very simple uh, method to store data where you, we came back to the 1960s, you store data in text files and binary files. And we thought everybody could agree on that. They thought everybody could agree on that. So they started that for fMRI, and now we do it for EEG. And that's like a standard here, that's a screen capture of a standard bids repository. You have a text files where you have your change. You have a folder where you put your code. Then you have a bunch of very specifically described files like data set description and these are uh, these are not these are text files 
but uh, the fields inside the text file are very specific. When you have a, fi uh, a file for participants, etc., so all these files, they're just text files, you can read them, but they're formatted in a very specific way. And if your file doesn't fit the description, it won't pass what's called the bits validator. Then you have your original data, if you have any, your stimuli, so you even put the, the audio sounds or things like that you've used, and then you have your subjects, so the subject is your one, and then you have the raw data, the channel locations, the events, etc. And we're happy because in bids, uh, we're able to add to the general uh, definition what we call HAD tag, which are hierarchical event descriptor. So that's something we uh, pioneer in our lab, is that if I share data and you share data, well, uh, uh, for me, it might be in French, you know, all the stimulus description. For you, it might be a different language. And it doesn't matter if you're both on the same database, you won't be able to make any sense of it. So that's where the hierarchical even descriptor, uh, descriptor uh, play, can play a role because for each of your event, for everything that happens in your uh, data, you're going to assign a prototyp prototypical events in English language. And uh, once you have that, you can do meta-analysis over a uh, large amount of data. So that's already in bids. And as I mentioned, uh, for mobile brain imaging, there, needs to, there, is, there, is, there is already a task force for multimodal uh, EG data. And anybody can join. So if you want to join the task force and help define the format. And it's very important that you, you guys get involved uh, because Multimodal is a lot of things. You have eye tracking, you have, so, and so lots of people don't necessarily feel, uh, 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 think in terms of uh, motion sensors, and there might be special um, uh, constraint to that. We put the first BIDS EG data. It's a meditation study I did with my first graduate student, Tracy, who married my second graduate student, Cedric. <laughs> And so that's the first one. The second one was the mobile brain imaging data where we have the Raman programmer here, Raman, and uh, Johanna, which I mentioned already. And uh, they also got married. And, uh, and this one is a, it's a walking study. So this one is uh, mobile brain imaging. And uh, I'll, I think I show a demo at the end of the day about how you can use that once you have bits data, once how you can import bits into an EG lab study, how you can uh, you can do things with uh, bits study automatically on all subjects uh, at the same time. So there's tools already in EG lab to process uh, bits data. We just need the data. So the second thing, once you have uh, big data, mobile brain imaging, big data, is you need automated processing pipelines because obviously you can't go through tons of data by hand as we usually do in, in the lab. And so that's the standard uh, EG lab processing pipeline. You import your data, you might remove unwanted channels because uh, uh, for instance, depending on the amplifier, some channels are flat. You high pass filter the data, you re-reference, then you can identify uh, bad channels and reject portion, data portions. So for this, uh, we've opted in our pipeline. You can use other methods. We opted to use uh, artifact subspace reconstruction, and I'll talk about it just briefly in a second. Then you re-reference the data, you run ICA, and you reject your bad components. And for this, in our pipeline, we've opted to use uh, IC label which are obviously two tools we develop ourselves. And um, so, the, so this is the first step. This is uh, artifact subspace reconstruction. And actually, when you use ASR, it's a collection of algorithms. So you have algorithms to reject bad channels, and that's not ASR per se. That's one of the tools included with ASR. So that's the first one. And the first, so first we identify bad channels. It's very simple. You look at the pairwise correlation between channels. And this is, this is bad data, and this is good data. 
And basically, in good data, the channels are neighboring channels are highly correlated. And here we can see like uh, some holes in there, and that means that these channels are probably bad. So that's how you detect bad channels. <coughs> and then there is this uh, um, a very smart method to uh, reject bad portions of data in which uh, you have some reference data and then you run some principal decomp component analysis and you compare with all the windows in your data and you can d detect outliers windows and you, there is also a method to correct uh, the, the bad portions of, of uh, data. So now you've, uh, you've pre-processed your data and uh, the next step is to automatically uh, find a bad uh, components. And for this, uh, Luca Piontoninarchi in our lab uh, developed this tool that's called IC Label. And so, so how do they take bad components? Well, it's relatively easy. First, you ask, ask a bunch of people what are bad components, and then you apply powerful machine learning technique to automatically find it. So that's exactly what he did and it cost him an iPad. He had to give out an iPad to the people who classified the most component. So he set up an online website. People classified 18,000 components, about 100 people, and the one who classified the most won an iPad. And then, and, uh, and, and you can still go on, on the website right now. I think it's called labeling.ucsd.edu. No. 100% sure. But if you go there, we actually also use this website for training people. Because you need to learn to recognize uh, uh, bad components. And once you do that, so you see you have buttons in the bottom, you can say, okay, I think this component is muscle, I think this component is eye. And you can actually compare your uh, selection with that of uh, experts. So you can see what the experts think it is. And sometimes the expert on agrees, so it's not 100%. He also compared his method with other automatic uh, methods for rejecting uh, components. The advantage of his method is that it was detecting more classes of components. And that's actually something that could be applied to mobile brain imaging when, once there is more classes of components, which are being uh, crowdsourced. His framework actually allows to automatically learn new classes so maybe it um, would be worth to talk to him about generalizing uh, this approach to detect more classes which are specific to mobile brain imaging. So ICA, we've talked a lot about ICA. We won't uh, have time to go into it. I put this slide because this is, uh, uh, was proud of this when so I think it was just be even before Klaus arrived. And uh, I was recording some data with 256 channel and I found all these components which were corresponding to the, we realized at the time were corresponding to the insertion points of, of, uh, uh, of muscle. So this is the type of components that Klaus was, uh, was basically talking about. You can uh, separate individual muscle on the scalp. So now you've uh, pre-processed your data. It's clean. You've run ASR, you run IC label, your data is clean. What are you going to do with that data? Well, you, the, the, you're interested in brain dynamics. You're interested in what's happening in the brain. So I've uh, personally uh, been trying to develop tools uh, for the past uh, almost 20 years. And this is the first what we call brain movie, which I developed. And that's uh, identify brain regions and then computing uh, information flow between brain region. This is uh, another one uh, a couple of years later. This is another one that was uh, uh, when Tim Mullen arrived, he developed his own solution for uh, doing brain movies. And that's another one he realized he, he, he developed with uh, uh, UCSF. This version was actually used uh, by the director of NIH. NIH is uh, government research in the US. He tries to raise, it looked good, <laughs> so he tried to raise more money for, in, in the US Congress, for uh, uh, neuroscience. I don't know the end of the story if it worked or not. 
And so, and so the, the one I'm uh, using right now, so that's very recent, I'm working with uh, Stefan Hoffer uh, at uh, Berlin Charité Hospital. And uh, he's developed a, a, a collection of scripts, and, that's the, and so we've, uh, we've put that into uh, EGLAB plugin and to do connectivity analysis. The previous one, the previous movie I showed you, lots of them were based on ICA, and there's a problem with doing connectivity an uh, analysis with ICA. You can do connectivity analysis with ICA using this method as well, although I won't enter the details. But basically, there's, there's two st uh, a couple of steps. The first one, you need to align your electrodes with the head model. So I think you all, uh, in the advanced section, you'll talk about head models and, and doing source localization. Then you want to align uh, what's called a brain atlas with the cortical model, and then you combine the two. So basically, you start by doing uh, Loretta on your data, for example. So let's say you have 64 channels and one hour of data. Now you end up with, uh, if you do Loretta, depending on the number of uh, voxel you have in your model, but you might have like 5,000 voxel times one hour of data. So you move from channel space to uh, uh, cortical space. But it's very smooth in the cortical space. There's like constraints when you use Loretta. And plus, you can't really do connectivity analysis between 5,000 brain regions. So what do you do? Well, uh, Stefan Hoffer thought, well, I'm going to use regions of interest based on fMRI atlases. So you see you have atlas, and then I'm going to kind of average the activity within a, a given brain area, and then compute the activity between brain areas. And that's a simplification. He actually uses uh, something a little bit more advanced. The other uh, important uh, contribution is that the issue when you compute brain connectivity between uh, uh, neighboring areas, or even faraway areas, is volume conduction. Volume conduction is the reason why they are very blurry right here. And a lot of these measures, like Ranger causality or partial directed coherence that measure information flow, are very dependent on, on, uh, on common uh, contribution to several uh, brain areas. So this is going to, like for instance, you see this activity, it's going to create artifactual connectivity between these two brain areas. Is the algorithm is going to say these are connected <coughs> even if they're not, just because of limitation of the technique. So what he introduced, he, he uses actually the cross spectrum and time reverse Granger causality. So the cross spectrum is actually going to just compute the phase lag. I'm going to show you that in a second. And this is time reverse Granger causality in which he compares. So Granger causality is a measure to uh, uh, look at information flow, so it compares the fast, the moving forward information flow compared to the moving backward information flow, and that gives him a good baseline to look at um, spurious connectivity. So in the plugin right now, you can use uh, either volumetric atlases. So these are atlas which are defined in the volume, the brain volume, or you can use what we call surface atlas, where in which you flatten the cortex and now the, the brain areas are defined on the, on the cortical surface. And in the plugin right now, you can use these three, although we're planning to uh, put in more. And this is just to give you uh, intuition into the, the type of measures uh, we're measuring. For instance, if we want to, we have these two brain areas, and we want to know uh, if this one, the activity of this one precedes the activity of this one. So we look in the frequency domain, and uh, we're going to look at the phase lag between the two, and we're going to do that across trials. So that's trial one, trial two, trial three. And if the vector is always in the same direction, it means we have one area that's always leading the other. And basically, we take the average of the phase difference, and that gives us an average phase difference. So then we have both the amplitude of the vector that represents the amount of coupling and the orientation that represents the phase lag. And so basically this technique, the only thing it tells us is, okay, we have one process that's leading the other one. The phase of one is statistically before the phase of the other one. 
And this is a method. So we're back. I was using this method in 2002 before all the more complex methods came along, directed transfer entropy. This is a simplistic method. But the advantage is that it's very robust to spurious uh, connection. So we're back, we're back to the very simple solution. We just use Loretta and phase lag. So that's like the simplest uh, thing you can do. Nothing super fancy. And these are some graphical e output of, uh, of the plugin where uh, here, so you see, you, hit, you see this delineation, these are based on the regions of interest. So basically when it's red here, in this example, it means the regions are highly interacting. <laughs> and then of course you can plot the matrix of interaction between brain regions. So you have 68 brain regions here on this axis, 68 on this axis, or you can also plot some uh, diagram that indicates the, the interaction, the regions which interact the most. So now we have a uh, relatively simple, so we've processed all our data, we did source localization, we did connectivity analysis, and now we want to uh, uh, compare between conditions. We want to do something useful with our data. I mean, it's nice to see all these regions are connected, but you need to do a contrast between, for instance, uh, condition one and condition B, or an array of condition. So that's the statistical framework. And in EEG Lab, our statistical framework is based on uh, the general linear model. So I'll explain you in, the, in a few slides what we mean by that. And the GLM, basically, it's a, it's, it's a statistical framework that's and the t-test, ANOVA, regression, etc. So it's a very uh, encompassing. You can basically, with the GLM, you can do whatever you want. So that's why we use it. And um, so, for instance, if you have a simple uh, regression, that's a linear model. So for instance, here we have an image, and we vary the contrast of the image, and we measure reaction time. So that would be, uh, and then we, we can plot a regression line. So that's our model. Right here, reaction times equal a constant plus the slope plus an error. And you can put it in your preferred software. It's going to output some numbers. So that's a simple regression. If we put that in the framework of the GLM, you basically have a bunch of uh, equation, reaction time ones equals the contrast times the slope, etc. And then you enter that into your uh, GLM software, and it's going to find a solution that's identical to the regression. And basically, the way it, it determines if the um, result is significant or not is that it compares the complex model in which you have the slope to the models where you remove the slope. And if the fits is better, then you can you can as conclude that this is significant. So that's just for regression. You have two continuous variables. Um, now, what about uh, ANOVA? Well, ANOVA, let's say we have three types of images, fishes, birds, reptiles, and we want to see if there's a difference in reaction time between these three types of images. So that's, that's basically an ANOVA. And to model that, we have reaction time equals a constant plus uh, a constant term, which depends on the stimulus, plus the error. So for instance, if we have a bird, it's going to be reaction time is equal to constant plus, uh, well, no fishes, bird, plus no reptile, plus air. If we had a reptile, for instance, this term would be 1 and this term would be 0. If we have another image of a bird, it's going to be the same one, except the air would be different. You do the fit with your GLM software. <laughs> and again, what you do to know if the model is significant, is that you compare your complex model, you compare the fit uh, com uh, with the ones without the additional variables. And if this is significant, it tells you uh, basically the, the, uh, the ANOVA is significant. This, in terms of mathematics, this is strictly equivalent to using uh, an ANOVA. Now let's say you want to do ANOVA plus regression at the same time, an ANCOVA. Well, in the framework of the GLM, it's super simple. You just model your reaction time as a constant, plus the categorical variables, plus the continuous variable, plus the error. 
and that's it, and you just fit your model. And so you see that in the GLM framework, you can have as many categorical variables and as many continuous variable as you want. So what we use in the, in, in the, the jargon is called a design matrix. So for instance, if you have trial one to, one, one to three is equal to the first, let's say the birds, plus the constant, plus the error, trial four to six equals the, the reptiles, etc. So you have four categories of image. Here we don't have any continuous variables. You can see that you can model this actually uh, using this kind of representation. This is trial one to three, and we have a one here for beta one. So you can use the matrix representation of these equations. And this is called the design matrix. So all the, the, all the, once you have your design matrix, you're basically done uh, with uh, designing your model. And in a lot of paper, you will see actually something looking more like this. This is the same representation here, except the ones are in white here and the black represent uh, zero. So we take our EEG here, uh, epoch data uh, across all channels, and here every row represents one trial, so you stack up your trials. You have stimulus one here, stimulus two here, so that's your part, that's like your uh, condition comparison. And then here you have a continuous variable, so here you have your constant. And what you do is that you're going to move your time window to obtain uh, what we call beta parameters, which is the factor, so that's the one we just saw and uh, results for continuous uh, variables as well. So this is how it looks. Here you're going to fit a GLM at time zero, time one, oops, time zero, time one, etc. through time. So you fit a GLM at every single uh, latency. And then you plot the, the parameter fit as you would plot ERPs. So you plot them for categorical variables. So for stimulus one, stimulus two, stimulus and then the constant. And then you can also plot them for the continuous uh, variable. And that's what we call level one. So we do that for every single subject. And we also have some tricks when we do GLM to reject artifactual trial, which is very useful for uh, mobile brain imaging. It's actually working. Uh, much better in that case, this is called weighted least square, so it weights trials to just automatically uh, remove them. And we can also do bootstrap significance to, uh, for each of the uh, beta parameter. We can bootstrap trials and get uh, estimates, confidence interval estimates for beta parameters. So, you're, so what kind of answer, what kind of questions can we ask there? Well, we can ask for the effect of uh, stimulus one. Like when I present stimulus one, do you have a deviation from baseline? Well, then just look at the confidence interval for beta one, your first beta parameters. Does it overlap with zero or not? And then you can know if it's significant. And then you can also look at difference between stimulus one and stimulus two. In that case, you subtract beta two, uh, beta one from beta two and you get the confidence interval of that. So you can ask all kinds of questions once you have your uh, design model, your, uh, your GLM. You can also look across channels as you would do for standard ERP. And here, for instance, you can plot beta parameters and the significant beta and correct for multiple comparison. You can also plot, and we often do that, we can just plot the raw ERP and just mask for uh, uh, significance using the beta uh, parameter confidence interval. So in this, if you do that, it would be just as sim as it would be the same as if you were, if you just had two conditions, for instance, doing a t-test on the two conditions on the potential. So you can do the same representation as you used to. You just use a different method to calculate significance. Now, what do you do when you have multiple subjects? So this is just one subject. Now I have subject one, subject two, subject three, et cetera. I have all these channels for subject one, subject two. Well, we process them. Uh, we would, for instance, uh, process ERP, which means we can do uh, t-test. So we take all the beta one for subject one, subject two, subject three. We can do a t-test as if we were doing the grand average ERP for electrode CZ, for instance. 
So we can, do, we can do all the statistics we're doing on ERP, we can do on our beta parameter at the second level. And since the GLM is a, a general framework, what we actually do, we do a second level uh, GLM. And one might ask, well, why don't we put all the subjects in the uh, GLM? Well, it's much more computation expensive. And so some papers have shown that it's actually equivalent to do it in two stage or to do it in one stage. So we just do it in two stages. And this is an example uh, of an actual application. Here, uh, I look at the RMS across all the channels. I had a, a visual stimuli here, and I found, well, this is the area of interest here, this is the area of interest here. And I just run the GLM on these two time windows. And I didn't find, for, I had different types of pictures. I didn't find an effect of the type of pictures, but I found a group effect across subjects. Some subjects were intuitive, others were not. That's not that important. The other interesting thing is that I had the big five personality traits for my subject. And I was able to uh, find some differences. So this age is a continuous, these are all continuous variables. So you can see, not only, I can, you can add a bunch of variables to your uh, model. Here, personality traits, you could also add, as we saw, all the objects you might be uh, uh, looking at in your GLM. And assuming you have enough data, uh, you should be able to uh, you know, find something relevant to the question you're uh, uh, looking at. Now, what about, what about deep learning? So we already mentioned that in the question. And so my, my plan, my, my plan, my personal plan for deep learning, deep learning works based on images. Lots of these neural networks were developed for image classification. And so a good representation of trials uh, is more than the ERP, is called the event-related spectral perturbation. So it's the ERP in the spectral domain. So you have the ERP at every single frequencies. And here we have, nine, we have 12 trials. For example, so you would do you would do ERSP every single trial, and then in the output here you would you would have some uh, characteristics of the stimulus which is presented, like emotional or cognition related, and then you let the neural network uh, learn some relevant uh, feature about the data, and then you can look, for instance, at in the individual output neurons here that would encode. Uh, in, in interesting feature and be able to classify uh, your data as well. And then in the deep uh, neural network framework, it's actually argued that you don't even need that stage. You just put in the raw data and then um, the network will learn automatically to extract the features which are the most interesting. Even, you know, maybe do a uh, spectral decomposition. That's a special interest to me because I started in the, in, in the neural network. When my PhD, I did my PhD on neural networks. And uh, I was doing a biological network for uh, image classification. So this is, this is the kind of network I was doing. Very few layers. It was only here like uh, uh, four layers. And so I just wanted to put a slide on what has changed uh, like 20 years ago, I was doing this, and now. And, and the first thing that has changed, this is a paper from Microsoft, is the, what's called the unreasonable effect of big data. It's like, in these networks, we're putting hundreds of images, and um, other people, we're putting 1,000, 10,000 at the most. And this is actual results. Uh, it's, this is more like a word or a semantic classification. And these are, for instance, this is uh, 1 million word, 10 million, 100 million, 1,000, 1, 1 billion word. And so here you can see this curve keep on increasing. Performance keeps on increasing. So when you stop at 10,000 images, you, you just, you just like here. So, so people realize <laughs> Yeah, we just, we just need a lot of data. The other things which have changed is deeper is better. 
it's like in, in the old days, we thought we would just put one layer or a couple, you know, it's like, what's the point? And uh, here, um, people realize, well, the, and there is actually a curve through time in 2000 to 2015 that shows, okay, people put 10 layers work better. Okay, 20 work better, 100. And right now, the standard is more like 200, 200 layers of, of uh, neurons. So deeper is better. Then we were using biological rules for the transfer function. We found linear is simpler. And, and another thing is the normalization of the weights at each layer. They found some smart way to normalize the weights and also some cool tricks to summarize the, the activity. But basically the story is nothing's changed, just rescale. Which is, which is good news, at least for me, because I, I know what we did. So we can just scale it up and fit it into that framework and use that for uh, deep neural networks. So we might see in the next couple of years uh, some of these tools in EEG now. The last thing we need for big data is a computational framework. I mean, you can have data, you can have pre-processing pipeline. If you're sitting at your laptop, you're not going to go very far. And so for this, we've developed, uh, in collaboration with the San Diego uh, supercomputer, uh, Comet, we actually got a grant to, to develop, uh, on, this is called the Neuroscience Gateway, so you can start EG Lab on the Neuroscience Gateway, you can upload your script and run them on the supercomputer. Anybody in the world can do that. You don't need to be in the US can do, to do that. And we also have a plugin where you can run your jobs from within EG Lab. And we're also developing a framework so other plugins can use this plugin to submit their job and recover uh, the data. That's, in, that's is if you are uh, within EG Lab. And that's not a very structured framework, that's just to try it out. Then for a more structured framework, right now we are uh, defining what we call derived bits data. So you have your raw bits data, you apply a pre-processing pipeline, then you have derived data. And we are defining the format for the derived data. So you can build a pipeline of tasks, for instance, social localizations, connectivity, and study contrast. So all the, thing, all the pipelines I've talked about, pre-processing, connectivity, and looking at contrast. And all of these would correspond to different apps uh, that would run on uh, derived bits data. And the data doesn't have to be duplicated. There is uh, ways uh, around, around this. And the way this works is that these apps, um, they run in what's called a Docker container. So, uh, so these are called bits app because they work on bits data set. And they're encapsulated into uh, uh, a virtual machine. So that's, that's a Docker. That's called a Docker. And the, the advantage of this is that you can run the virtual machine on your personal computer, but you can also run it on the supercomputer. And, uh, and, for, and for instance, uh, we're using uh, Cbrain, Xseed, or the Open Science Grid, which is a framework that uh, anytime a supercomputer is not used, you can use it for free. And we've, we've actually uh, built the first Docker for uh, EEG. And this one just does pre-processing, so it ends with IC label and tells you the classification of your uh, components. We've also, running out of time, so we've also uh, did some proof of concept. Uh, this is processing 1100 subjects. And here was different age and eyes open, eyes closed. So we did that on the supercomputer. Actually it only took two hours about uh, 2,400 processor uh, to, to process this. So pre-processing and, and, and all, all that data. And this is also uh, Amica. This is another proof of concept. Uh, Amica running on about 1,500 CPUs. <coughs> Here, this, this, is, this, this is actually a uh, loss of, loss of it's, not, it's not very good use of the CPU because it doesn't scale very well, but we can, we can do all these things. And this is on the previous data. This is some machine learning, including deep learning, applied 
to, uh, uh, to this data. So we can already do that at a small scale. We just need, we just need to, um, to uh, work on the infrastructure so we can do it in a more robust way. And also we'll make all of this available for people. So now we need data. And uh, so the data, uh, in, in my case, is uh, being acquired by my PhD student, Cedric. He also published uh, a paper on uh, wearable technology where he compared all the wearable technologies. So you can, it's not available yet, so it's a uh, upcoming uh, book chapter. He's going to acquire 1,000 subjects using the Muse. So we're de developing also artifact rejection for the Muse. The people are not necessarily moving in that case, they're just wearing the Muse. And then the other data we're working with is from Michael Milham. This is 128 channels I mentioned. Uh, before during the panel discussion. Right now it has 3,000 data sets and it's planned for 10,000. And he has eye tracking. So the kids are looking at the screen with eye tracking and they're watching a movie and he has all the movie pre-tagged as I was with the objects which appear in which par part of the screen. So we can lose, uh, use the framework I described uh, uh, previously. So we're, we're we're not there yet, but we're, we're not far. It's not like uh, science fiction. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. And these are all the people in the short center. Scott. Uh, Scott, Ramon, Johanna, Luca, and uh, uh, Francisco. We just left for Facebook, by the way. Because they want the probably the I don't know if he was working on mobile maybe Eugene. Thanks, Arnaud. I have to admit that when you said it's uh, stupid simple, that I was like, okay, I'm the only stupid guy here. <laughs> but uh, yes, it's amazing what uh, what you managed to achieve. I don't know. Can you like how how do you keep uh, EG Lab usable with all these new information and all these things piling up? This is like a very personal perspective. Yeah, well, this we uh, have people develop plugins so they don't mess up the core code. And so we also develop plugin ourselves. So this way, this, we, we don't modify the core code very much. And then people are responsible for, uh, for plugins. And yeah, when I was saying it was very simple, it's like you'll see uh, Tim's talk tomorrow. He talks about the complex stuff. Doing Loretta, is is simple and doing phase lag is is simple i mean when you talk to the expert in source connectivity it's like too simple you know they don't want to do that it's like mathematically too dumb but uh, it's also you know why it might be more robust and more advanced approach uh, i think we have time for one question klaus thanks a lot for the talk Anu. um my question simply is, um, we started playing around with Limo a little bit, and uh, looking at the general linear model and its use in fMRI, this would be a huge opportunity to start looking into mechanistical explanations, f e.g. and behavior, for example, also mm -hmm. for Mobi. Um, so why doesn't it take off? Or why because you haven't done it yet. It? Yes. <laughs> 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 what is the issue behind it? Well, the issue, the main issue with Limo is, is user friendliness. I mean, whoever has tried Limo here, I mean, I'm struggling with Limo every day, trying to do anything. So that's what we're working on with Cyril. So Cyril Pernet, who's here, by the way. So he's the one who developed Limo. And, uh, he's a stat person that doesn't speak our language, neuroscientist. And it's just hard to communicate with him, and, uh, and so we're working on that also, yeah, on tutorial so people can actually uh, use Limo, because right now it's not user friendly at all, so I think that's the main. You can use it, it's just hard. <laughs> <laughs> so we're working, we're working on that, you know, writing tutorials, educating people, and, and, and so I'm using it now so I can try to do it. 